During the time that Israel was divided, God told a prophet named Elijah that there would be a drought in the land. He directed Elijah to leave the area and live by himself for three years near a ravine where he would have all the water he needed. One day, God told Elijah to go and confront King Ahab and his wife Jezebel about leading the Israelites to worship a false god named Baal. Elijah asked Ahab and all the people of Israel to meet him on the top of a mountain. Ahab brought 450 prophets of Baal with him. Elijah decided to conduct a challenge to prove that he followed the true God. Two bulls were brought to be sacrificed. The prophets of Baal laid down pieces of wood and put the bull on it, but did not set fire to it. Call on the name of your God, Elijah challenged, and I will call on mine. Whichever answers by fire, he is God. From early morning until noon, the prophets asked their god Baal to send fire, but nothing happened. Elijah taunted them, shout louder, perhaps your god is in deep thought or sleeping. So they shouted louder and cut themselves with their swords and spears, but still nothing happened. He quickly built an altar using 12 stones, one to represent each tribe of Israel. Finally, he asked those around him to pour water all over the bowl and the wood. There was so much water flowing that it filled the trench around the altar. Then Elijah called out, Let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And fire fell from the sky and burned up the bowl, the wood, and even the stones and soil. When the people saw this, they fell to their faces and yelled, The Lord, he is God. The prophets of Baal were then arrested and killed in the valley below the mountain. When King Ahab returned home and told his wife Jezebel what happened, she was furious and sent word to Elijah that she was going to have him killed. So Elijah fled to the wilderness. There he met an angel sent by God to take care of him, who gave him food and water. Eventually, God told Elijah that Elisha would take his place as a prophet in Israel. Not long after, Elijah and Elisha were walking along the road and a chariot and horses made of fire appeared out of nowhere and took Elijah up into the sky. So Elisha continued to do God's work, performing miracles, and at one point even raising a young boy from the dead. Elijah stretched out his body over the boy and caused him to sneeze seven times, bringing him back to life. For many years after, God continued to use Elisha and a number of other prophets to perform miracles and warn the Israelites of all that would happen to them if they did not follow God. Despite the prophets' warnings, the next several kings led Israel further and further from God. It was only a matter of time before things had to change. Good morning. We're so glad you're joining us today. It's a privilege to have you here at Bethel Assembly. I'm not able to be with you this morning because I am working as a chaplain and deputy with the Pennington County Sheriff's Department. For those of you that don't know, I help with the chaplain program and I'm also a deputy on the side, building relationships in our community in a very different way. And I want to say thank you to Bethel for allowing me to exercise this heart and passion of mine in this part of ministry. It's been amazing to see the fruit and the relationships that have been developed. And I know God's going to be opening doors even as we're working through the rally. So I appreciate you giving me the ability to go and minister in a different way in our community during this 75th motorcycle rally. I want to encourage you to tune in your ears and listen to what John is going to be sharing with you today. John Leitenberg is the director of Love, Inc. He is a great man, a great friend, and I know he's going to have a strong word to share with you today as we press on through the story. Enjoy it. It's going to be a great day, and would you welcome John to the stage? All right. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. I want to start off today with, I want to see your best smile. So if everybody could just like pretend I'm taking your picture, give me your best smile. Do you know that it's important? Oh, that's a good one. I like your smile. So I'm just so happy to be here with you today. Uh, last night I had a rough night. I've got five kids. I have a three-year-old who just, just had a rough night. He was just, I think, like overtired. So like at two in the morning, he was just, just wild and awake. 
But it reminded me of a story my daughter told me this week about the same boy, Silas. Uh, Anna was trying to put him down for a nap. And so she got him all settled down and quieted, got it all dark in the room, and said, uh, okay, it, you're all set, and it's good to go. I'm going to go now. And she's like, he's like, no, 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 stay with me, stay with me. She's like, no, I got to go, you sleep. He's like, but I'm afraid. And she said, you don't have to be afraid because Jesus is with you. And he said, but Jesus is in heaven. And she says, well, but he's also in your heart. And he said, oh, well, I want someone to sleep with me who's not in my heart. <laughs> so... He eventually fell asleep, but somehow that didn't work last night. So. so if I fall asleep, no yawning, by the way, because I can't handle it. Because if I yawn, then everyone's going to yawn. So I'm watching you suppress those yawns. Uh, we've been in the story and uh, reading through the book. And uh, I want to I just kind of get us all up to speed. You know, God took... The people of Israel, they were enslaved in the country of Egypt for hundreds of years. There was like a million of them. And God sent his servant Moses to rescue them. And so Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt. And with Joshua came behind him. And they established themselves in the land of Israel, the promised land. And for hundreds of years... Israel was led by judges that would raise up every few generations to turn the people of Israel back to God. And finally, under the judge Samuel, the people said, we want a king. We need a leader. And so God gave them Saul, and after Saul was David, and after David was Solomon. And Solomon didn't serve the Lord with his whole heart. And after Solomon, the nation split into two. In the north, was the northern kingdom. And so that was mostly the 10 tribes in the north. And to the south was the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. The capital of the southern kingdom was Jerusalem. And after about five uh, different kings, the capital of the northern kingdom became Samaria. Okay? So the northern kingdom was referred to at that time, as you read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, the northern kingdom was referred to as the northern kingdom or Israel, and at the very end started being called Samaria after its capital. The southern kingdom was referred to as Judah. God, because the northern kingdom continually quit following Christ, God wiped out the northern kingdom, and then there was just Judah. Well, by the time Christ rolls around, about a thousand years later, we now, the people of the Jews, are in the nation of Israel, but it's actually the tribe of Judas primarily. And then what was the northern kingdom, Samaria, that's where we hear about the Good Samaritan and the Samaritan woman. Okay? And today that's the West Bank. That's kind of that area. So it gets confusing because Israel disappeared and then Judah became Israel. And it's just a lot to a lot going on. But we're in the time of the kings. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And we're going to read out of the story uh, from page 211, or if you're in your Bibles, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 18, 8 through 22. It says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing through that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the, the place indicated by the man of God, Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? Because he thinks there's a spy that's giving away the secrets. None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered. So I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. 
Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, This is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I'll lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked, and they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? No, do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who have captured, you have captured with your own sword or bow, without your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. You know, when you get into this part of the book of Kings and the stories of Elijah, and then especially the stories of Elisha, who, his predecessor, or the one who followed him, he, uh, it's amazing the things that they were doing. Can you imagine, and the miracles that they that they did. And can you imagine waking up in the morning, looking out your window, and there's tanks and an entire army out there? I mean, that would terrify anyone. And this reads like a fairy tale almost, but it was real. This really happened. And Elisha was a man who lived like he wasn't even from this earth. Like he was seeing things and experiencing things, just like what the king whispered in his chamber, Elisha heard because he was connected to God. God, because God was there. God hears it all. And he was letting Elisha in on that. And so Elisha prayed to his servant, or for his servant, the same thing would happen. It says here in, in chapter 16, Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so he may see. That same reality is true today. If in a way, if our eyes could be open, just like that servant, there is a reality that supersedes the reality we are now in. There are spirits and angels and God that, that is enveloping all of us. And Elisha could experience that. He saw God allowed him to see everything that was going on. And it wasn't unique to Elisha because Jesus Christ, when he came on the scene, he came preaching the kingdom of God. Now, we think about this and we think, oh, you know, Jesus preached so many things. He preached about forgiveness and about justice and about love. And he kind of explained how the law was, nobody could keep it. And so there had to be another way. He taught so many things about how to serve. But, you know, encapsulating all that, he preached the kingdom. It says in Luke 4.43, Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God because that is why I was sent. And a lot of people, even Jesus' closest followers, thought he was coming to establish an earthly kingdom, right? One that you could touch and feel. But Jesus, uh, John 18, says, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. There is something greater than this world. Jesus said in Luke 7, it says that when he was questioned by the Pharisees, he said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Right? And that's true today. Now, it's pretty wild. These Pharisees, and Jesus even confronts them on it. It's one of my favorite passages in the gospel. He says, you, to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you're going to find life, but it's these that testify about me, and I'm standing right in front of me, and you're not accepting who I am. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom, but he says it's not an earthly kingdom. He says the kingdom is here and now. Just like for Elisha, the kingdom was there. He just had to say to his servants, Lord, open his eyes so he can see what's really going on. And you know what? The reality for us is the kingdom is here. Christ is in our midst. There is more going on than meets the eye. But the problem is we get distracted. We begin to think that the material is all there is. 
that uh, work and life and busyness and worries is all there is. But there's something much greater, much more powerful. We get wrapped up. It's kind of like it's the kingdom versus consumerism. We get so wrapped up, especially in this country, with the things of this world, about what we don't have and about what we, what we need. And so Paul, and you'll see this throughout uh, the New Testament, continues to preach about and teach about the kingdom of God. This new reality, this new economy, this new way of seeing things, and it's not an earthly kingdom. Paul says in uh, Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom he's coming to establish. In fact, those things, righteousness, peace, and joy, they are greater than any material thing. The earthly, like Christ said, I didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. I'm setting up a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom that's greater than. So righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, we were talking about Samaritans and Samaria, and we have the story of the good Samaritan. And you think about this, righteousness. Uh, you know, the good Samaritan, uh, this man got mugged, right, and beat up and robbed on the side of the street, left for dead, and a Pharisee or a priest came walking by and did nothing, did not help him. And a lawyer came walking by and did not help him. And a Samaritan came by, and that's who helped him, right? Jews and Samaritans wanted nothing to do with each other. They hated each other because the Samaritans didn't believe the same things as the Jews. After all that time, their religion had gotten mixed up. And so they wanted nothing to do. And so we think about these things, people like the priests. We think, well, that was a righteous man, right? He's a good man. And some translations in this passage in Romans where it says righteousness, peace, and joy, some say goodness, peace, and joy. Sometimes we think like of righteousness as being like a goody two-shoes and that kind of like that, that high priest or that priest that ignored. But we think about that Samaritan. Who was the good character in that story? That's, that Samaritan was a good man because he would sacrifice himself. He would cross over barriers to go and help a fellow human being. He was a good man. And we think of goodness as nobility. Well, it's both righteousness, morality. The kingdom of God is about morality, but it's also about goodness. It's about being willing to go and be and serve. And so there are things that battle against righteousness in the kingdom of God. And so I've said, you know, the law... The law battles against righteousness, and lust battles against righteousness. Why? You say, well, the law? Well, yeah. Now, just imagine you had a fever, right? And, and you said, I'm going to go get a thermometer, and I'm going to and you're like, take this oh, 103 temperature. And you're like, I'm still sick, but I took my temperature. Huh, I'll take it again. It's still 103. Well, I'm still sick. And you just keep taking your temperature and you still are sick because a thermometer doesn't cure, cure you, does it? Well, the law doesn't cure you either. All it tells you is that you're sick, that you can't keep this. You can't keep the Ten Commandments and more. You're not good enough to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to have someone come into your life and be righteousness for you, fulfill the law for you. And that's what Jesus did. And so sometimes, though, we think, and Christians are especially prone to do this, we think, I just got to try harder. I just got to be better. I got to do more. And we put on ourselves shame and guilt, thinking that that's going to make us righteous before God. Christ is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. We don't need, we can't be our own righteousness. We're not good enough. We have to let go and let him be our righteousness. But the other trap, the other battle against righteousness and goodness in our life is, is sin. We're all prone to fall into sin. And in, uh, it says, Paul said, shall I continue to sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How can we who have died to sin continue to live therein? So then we think, well, then I'll just try harder. I'm battling sin in my life, battling temptation. I'm failing. I better just try harder. No, that's the law. We have to let go and ask Jesus, come and heal me, deliver me from the sin that I'm battling. 
So the kingdom of God is goodness, righteousness. The kingdom of God is also peace. And so often in our lives, we have so many things pressing us down, pressuring us, stealing, robbing our peace, don't we? We have work. We have family. We have home. We're trying to, some of us are just trying to survive, and it robs our peace. But a hallmark of the Christian should be peace. Peace is that surpasses understanding in our life. And so if you're feeling the pressure, you have to say, where is that coming from? It's not coming from God. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He brings peace. He is the Prince of Peace. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. We can still live in peace. Jesus Christ himself exemplified that. Do you remember the story? There was a time when he was in a boat and they're crossing the sea and this storm came up and the the disciples literally feared for their life. I can't, us people here about as far away from water as you can get, have a hard time imagining a stormy sea. But these guys, these were, these were fishermen who were fearing for their very lives. And do you remember what Jesus was doing? He was sleeping in the boat. And they're like, don't you know we're going to die? And he's like, what are you worried about? Because see, he was, his eyes was on the king. He was at peace. He was so at peace, he could be in a boat that's ready to capsize and take a nap because his eyes were on the king. He is the king, but his eyes were on his father. He was living in the peace. And it doesn't matter what's going around us either. We can experience that same peace. And maybe today you need to know that peace. It is available for you. You just have to put your eyes to the king. Well, the other thing, it says the kingdom of God is goodness, righteousness, peace, and joy. And I had you smile, remember? Some of us need to quit having grumpy faces and just smile, right? Cheer up. The kingdom of God is about joy. Don't take it so serious. You're not in charge. It's not up to you. And you can live in the life of Christ. But do you know what robs our joy? Jealousy right? Not being okay with who God made you to be and where he put you. Do you think it's a surprise to God where you're at in your life right now? No. He could have chose anyone to be where you're at, but he chose you. He wanted you to experience and overcome the things that you're experiencing in your life right now. You can have joy in your life, whatever is going on. We have brothers and sisters in this world right now, um, on the other side of the globe mostly, who are enduring tremendous trials. Their lives are in jeopardy. We have people who are living in Islamic nations who are encountering Christ in miraculous ways and choosing to follow him, even though it may cost them their very lives, even though it most definitely will ostracize them from their family, and they do it anyways. Do you know what's said of Christ? It said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame. It doesn't mean every moment of our life is happy-go-lucky. It doesn't mean hardships and trials won't come. But for joy set before us, too, we can endure what comes before us and walk with Christ into what he has for us. Well, I had a friend. I was, I was thinking on this passage today, and I was going through my sermon notes previously, because I'm like, I'm sure I preached on this verse before. And then I realized, no, it was a friend of mine, Adam, a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, shared this passage with me. And he had actually had a dream, and I think it was from God. And in his work, he went to work, and on everybody's desk was a gauge, okay? And it had three dials on it. And underneath each dial, it said righteousness, peace, and joy. And he said he was coming to work, and his co-workers would be working in their giftings, doing what they loved, and those gauges just kept going up. And they were so happy, and they were being so productive, and everyone was getting along so well. And it was, he said it was just an awesome thing. It was like so freeing. And then this, this fist would come down into his office and press on people, and those gauges would start to fall. The goodness, the peace, the joy would begin to slide down. And he And he, on that arm that pressed in, it said pressure, okay? And he said, 
it, his eyes are just opened. And he said, that's, that's like what life is like. There's so many things that are trying to get our focus. There's so many pressures in our life, so many advertisements and communications that are trying to get our focus off the king, telling us that there's life in something else other than Christ, that there's something that matters more than Christ. And it robs us. It robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us from wanting to be good to our neighbors because we become so consumed with ourselves and our worries. And so like what happened to Elisha, I think our prayers for ourselves and for his servants need to be, Lord, open our eyes so we can see. We know that there's more going on in this world than what meets the eye. And so today, I want to I pull you back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And sometimes you think, as a Christian, you think that you're still the old person. But you know, right now, if our eyes were opened and then we looked in the mirror, we wouldn't necessarily recognize who we are. Because God has made you a new creation. You're not the same. You don't have to live the same. You don't have to live like you used to live. You can live with righteousness, peace, and joy in your life. And so that's my prayer for me, for this church, for you that we, our eyes would be open, that the things that are happening to Elisha, those are, those are still happening in this world, folks. People are still turning. Miracles are still happening. We saw a picture of Elisha raising a boy to life, right? People are still being raised to life today. You know, I grew up Baptist, and Baptists are, they're kind of skittish about miracles today. I was at a conference, and there was a Southern Baptist at this conference, and he was, we were talking about small groups. He was in charge of small groups in China for the Southern Baptists. And he, he came to this conference and he said, I mean, because small groups in China, millions upon millions of people have found Christ at, through the underground church happening in people's homes. And he said, he's been, this, this Southern Baptist pastor said, I've been in people's homes who have been raised from the dead. He, he worked hard to get some strategic leaders together. It took him months to get these men in the same place without them getting in trouble and going to jail. And he got them all in the same place. And while they were meeting, the phone rang, and one of them got called out, and he came back. He says, guys, I'm sorry, but I have to leave. I'm like, do you know how hard it was to get this meeting together? He said, well, one of my key leaders in my network died, and I have to see if the Lord wants me to raise him from the dead. And this is coming from a Southern Baptist, not Assembly of God. Because he says, this is real. And God wants, just like God was speaking to Elisha, God wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal things to you. He wants to show you things so that you know that he is real in your life. And he wants to use you in ways that are beyond you. He wants to use this church in ways that are beyond it. He wants to change our city Change the brokenness and hurt that's here, and he wants to do it through us. So let's pray. Let's pray, God, open our eyes. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, who are we to be a part of the love and compassion and, that you have for us? You've called us into your kingdom. You've called us to experience your goodness, your peace, and your joy. Lord, to be for that to define our lives and so I ask, Lord, that you would come in. You would open our eyes today. Lord, if there are people here today whose peace is being robbed, that you would come and give them peace that surpasses understanding. If there are people who are trapped in sin, trapped in shame that they, they are not enough, Lord, help them to know today that you are their sufficiency. Lord, if, if there's some of us that lean more towards grumpiness than joyfulness. Lord, turn our frown upside down. Give us a smile that will bring the light and hope and joy of Christ to the people we encounter. And Father, we saw Pastor Jared today all decked up in his uh, uniform. And we just pray for our community this week. There's a million guests here, Lord. Uh, some of them are our brothers and sisters. A lot of them are thinking they're going to find life in motorcycles and partying. 
And we know it's not there, Lord. And we, we first we pray for our first responders. We pray your protection and safety over them. We pray for our brother, Jared, and in everywhere that you lead him. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes today. Let us see the reality of your kingdom and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, it was awesome to be here with you. And I pray that this week you would encounter Christ in a powerful way. Have an awesome week.